panel. I know that you must all have many, many questions. I have many myself, but I don't want to, to take the floor. Um, so if I could ask you to raise your hands, um, we will try and take as many questions as we possibly can. Please, can I ask you to keep your questions succinct so that we manage to hear from lots and lots of different people. And just to remind you that the presentations from all our presenters are now live online, so please have a look at those and review the slides if you want to as we're having questions. Okay, so can we take the gentleman in the pink shirt first? Thank you. Hi there, it's uh, Andrew Manson from the UK. Uh, one of the beneficial effects of nicotine that hasn't been spoken about much is its role as appetite suppressant. And also there's an observable increase in adult obesity which seems to correlate with reduced smoking incidence. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Hayek, if, in particular, if he believes that safer forms of nicotine could have a positive role with non-smokers and ex-smokers in addressing uh, obesity rates and the health effects of those. I, I think the effect probably will be too small to placate the critics of nicotine use, but I defer to Neil on this because he may have better knowledge of the effects of nicotine on weight. There, 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 there's no question that nicotine regular use reduces body weight compared to if you're... Uh, uh, is this on? Is this working? Okay, sorry. Wasn't. Um, there's no question that regular nicotine use lowers body weight. If you look at cigarette smokers versus non-smokers, um, there, there's an average difference of about three kilo or four kilo, um, which when you quit smoking, you regain back to baseline on average. The question has really been whether um, the smoking-related reduction in body weight is healthy because cigarette smoking or, or nicotine is thought also to change the distribution of fat in the body. So there's more abdominal fat, which is harmful compared to other fat. So while you, it can certainly affect body weight, and, and so some things would be independent, like blood pressure and diabetes risk would certainly be better if you weighed less. Um, but on balance, uh, it's been hard to show that the weight gain, at least in adult smokers, when you quit smoking and gain weight, that certainly doesn't outweigh the benefits of quitting smoking. Uh, but, but for pure nicotine, again, we don't know. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. I think it's been a bit of a taboo subject in the past, but now that there's safer forms of nicotine, we should certainly be discussing it a lot more openly. Uh, this is Rajesh, or uh, maybe this is for Lynn or, or um, uh, Neil. Uh, when you interpret nicotine effect using smoking, uh, how do you, um, and there's so many other confounding factors around there. Any comments on it, uh, if any one of you? This is heavy. <laughs> is this on? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I acknowledge that there's a lot of a lot of studies have shown changes um, that are associated with smoking, but it is very difficult to, uh, to isolate the effects of nicotine. And it is something that could be done fairly easily um, nowadays. I mean, if we want to look at effects on mood or cognition, um, we just need to look at smokers who have quit smoking but continue to use nicotine versus smokers who have, have quit and not use nicotine. And um, there may be studies that have done that, but um, I am not aware of them. May maybe others are. But certainly with now with, with vaping, um, that is something that, that we could easily s begin to look at. So just one comment. There have been studies that have looked at um, the effects of cigarettes versus e-cigarettes. Study we did that, that, that I talked about, and certain things basically work the same. So e-cigarettes, even at lower nicotine deliveries, relieve withdrawal symptoms just as well as cigarettes. 
But the positive reward, how much people like it, at least in our studies, show that dual users like cigarettes more than e-cigarettes, even though the nicotine exposure is the same, uh, which it, I think others have shown that as well. So there are ways to, to tease this out, but the effects are clearly different on some responses for cigarettes versus just nicotine. Hello, I'm Thea Jordan from uh, the UK. Uh, this is a question for Professor Hayek. Um, at one point you talked about middle-aged people who'd been smokers for a long time who were then vaping. And I just wonder, is there any point in making any efforts to get those kind of people to quit vaping? Or could it in fact be a lifetime a form of man monitoring and managing their previous habits? As far as I'm concerned. <laughs> sorry. No, sorry. It was for you, actually. It was for you. But I, yeah, for Peter. <laughs> yes, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I can't see anything wrong with people continuing to vape for the rest of their life if they're so inclined and they find it rewarding. And maybe, would you like to, Neil, would you like to comment here? I, uh, for me, the, the, the biggest issue is whether they're confident in not relapse into smoking. If there's the, the alternative of smoking, then I have no concern with lifelong use of vaping. Um, you know, I do have, for um, biological reasons, concerns, say with people who have got coronary heart disease, I think there are potential effects on arrhythmias, on lipids, and things like that that are detrimental, not nearly as detrimental as cigarette smoking. So in my patients, I encourage them, say, if they are stable on these cigarettes for a year or two and they're fine, I would ask them to consider getting off these cigarettes. But if there's any concern about relapse of smoking, I'm happy that they vape. Okay, thank you very much. Can I add to that? Yes. Yeah, I think. If I can say something, so I think the trial, you know, if it was over two years, I could, I probably will see a higher number of people who have succeeded by moving away from combustibles. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with Neil's point as well. I mean, it depends on the risk of relapse. Um, but also the other issue um, is um, whether the, the vapor feels happy. You know, it, it's how the person feels about it themselves. Are they happy? To, can they afford to vape? Um, can they afford to continue using nicotine in some other form? Is it an issue for them? And um, for some, it may be. Um, for, others, for others, it may not be. Uh, Dr. K.K. Agarwal, I am a physician cardiologist in India. I'm here. Uh, very uh, basic question as a practicing doctor. In India, number one cancer related to smoking in urban areas is lung cancer, and in rural areas is oral cancer. We have the, we have the largest number of diabetics in the country, so we have the largest number of sudden cardiac death in the country. Therefore, Smoking now is linked to oral cancer, lung cancer, and coronary artery disease with sudden cardiac death. One of the slides showed that uh, apart from COPD, that is chronic obstructive airway disease, where it has been said that nicotine is not linked. In all other situations, nicotine is linked. And we also know that nicotine is less harmful than tobacco. In terms of numbers, what is the number we can tell the patients that if you sh switch from combustible tobacco to nicotine smoking or vaping, what will be the percentage reduction in lung cancer? What will be the percentage reduction in oral cancer, shifting it to SNUS? And what will be the percentage reduction in sudden cardiac death? Because that's the only answer people ask us a question with that as a medical doctor. Neil, <laughs> we'd love to have the answer to well, that. I, I think this is a, for, for sure for lung cancer, um, the, the risk will markedly drop off depending on how long they've been smoking. But the risks, um, I think, will be, be very low. The, the, we still don't have data on whether there is any promotion effect if you had pre-existing lung cancer, but certainly much less than cigarette smoking. And I, I, I wouldn't give that a number. I would say it's very low. Um, you know, for oral cancer, there are also some some biological studies suggesting that nicotine could promote oral cancer, but again, my, my sense would be that would be relatively low. 
Um, for sudden cardiac death, I haven't got that concern because, as, as, as you know, we, we, um, when, you look, when you have increased sympathetic activity and you have ischemia, you have not enough blood supply to the heart, your risk of having a fatal arrhythmia and sudden death is higher. And, and the data with Swedish snus, although the risk ratios are relatively low, show that fatal myocardial infarction is higher in snus users even though myocardial infarction itself is not higher. So it looks like the fatality rate is higher and that could be all consistent with sympathetic neural activation. So that, again, I get back to the question, if I have someone with coronary disease, um, if they're confident in not smoking, I would like them to get off, because I think there's a risk, not super high compared to smoking, but there is a significant risk. Uh, but I was from Germany here, one question. Uh, I often talk to dentists and they report to me that when they have smoking patients, uh, the output of the treatment often is reduced and even in the placing of implants uh, this is a big issue and when we talk they, they talk about nicotine is one of the reason why this is do you have any data comparing smoke in the dental area the treatment versus the nicotine so can is it a nicotine effect or more likely that it's a smoking effect I'll start with that, although I don't know the answer, but I do know, is it Richard Halliday, who's, who's just recently had funding to, to look at that? So I don't know the answer, but I know there is a study that's recently been funded to, to explore the effects of nicotine on dental hygiene, specifically okay. through vaping. Is anyone else? Yes, so what, what was your question about implants in specifically? Nicotine versus smoking effects right, right, on dental but, hygiene. But what are you talking about? the survival of dental implants or just dental disease in general? Yes, yes, the, the output the dentist reported to me when they place implants in the, in the area, in the mouth area, cable area, the output of treatment more often after many years is worse than non-smokers. So they relate this effect on vasoconstruction on the, on the uh, mouth area because they say that the blood flow is reduced through the nicotine. So I'm not sure if it's the, the toxic effects of all the ingredients of the smoke that affect more the cytotoxicity of, of uh, this is the reason, or if it's really the reduce of blood flow in the area of the implant through to the nicotine. Right. Well, the, 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 the certainly there's a biological plausibility for nicotine to do that because it does constrict blood vessels, it does reduce flow. Um, and some people like plastic surgeons when they're doing uh, skin transplants don't want people to use nicotine because nicotine clearly reduces skin blood flow. Uh, you, you, you give people pure nicotine, their skin temperature drops. So I think there's a biological concern. I just don't know if there are any data on, on pure nicotine. Uh, Saul Schiffman, uh, University of Pittsburgh and Penny Associates consulting to Reynolds. Um, I guess the elephant in the room has been this brain damage uh, issue that Neil didn't have a chance to talk about that uh, Peter addressed. So I'd like to get both of you, maybe all of you, uh, to re-engage that and, and to comment, as Peter did, that we've had decades of much greater nicotine exposures without anyone ever s saying they'd noticed some kind of uh, uh, brain damage in adolescence as, re as a result. And I'll also comment that when I look at the um, evidence that's cited, what's cited is changes in the brain, and that gets translated into damage. Uh, but we know that algebra, learning algebra, also changes the brain, and we don't consider that to be damage. So I think as we address this, we need to distinguish this idea of rewiring the brain, which also happens uh, with learning and maturation, from what we decide and how we decide to call something damage. So I'm hoping the two of you will fight it out there. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start. So there, there are a lot of different studies in, in rodents looking at nicotine. And to my reading, the, the main effects are not damage per se, it's delay of maturation, especially the prefrontal cortex, um, which is involved in executive function decision-making, impulsivity control. So it's not as if there's permanent damage, it's that there are <coughs> potential behavioral effects. And, and in rodents um, that get nicotine during adolescence, there are behavioral and cognitive effects <coughs> that are seen 
later on when they're not getting nicotine as adult rodents. And for drug-seeking behavior, there are animal studies exposing rodents to nicotine during adolescence and then stopping nicotine and then exposing them to drugs like cocaine later on and showing increased self-administration. So I wouldn't call it brain damage. Um, in humans, it's very difficult to tell because of confounding of all sorts. But I don't think people think that it's causing people to become senile as an adult. It really is their behavioral effects uh, in adolescents and young adults how significant they are, I don't think we can tell. Uh, but it's hard to say that there's not any. And, and, and so I think when decisions are made about adolescent using nicotine, these things have to be at least considered, although we don't know how, how important they are. So I have a question for Neil. Uh, what, how would it manifest itself? What are we talking about? Well, um, I, think, you know, I think your comments about drug use, so in, in, in theory, based on, on the animals, um, drugs of abuse would be more reinforcing in, in uh, young adulthood, for example, if there was nicotine use a, as an adolescent. There could be more impulsivity, more motor vehicle accidents, more uh, all kinds of, of impulsive behavior problems. Um, so you would expect higher, a higher uh, injury rate or it, 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 it's if you want, you, you want to have a look, so what would be you be looking for? So you would be looking for higher incidence of drug addiction, so that's one, and then what, what would be the consequence of the others? Because it's very vague to say that yeah. there's some maturation problems. What, what are they? Well, well I, th um, I think you could look at, at risk-taking behaviors, at um, accidents. Uh, it, in, with cigarette smoking, it's been very difficult to do that because of the confounding of, of who is a cigarette smoker. But I think uh, with kids who are relatively low risk for cigarette smoking using e-cigarettes, actually could be a way to look at that question now and see if, if there is any difference. Um, in, in drug use and accidents. Those, the, 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 those would be two things I would look at. Can I step in at this point? I mean, not so much in adolescence, and as Neil says, the, it's so difficult because of the confounds, but um, the, I think it was the British doctors survey showed that long-term smoking was associated with a cognitive decline between the ages of 45 and 55. However, though, it, this wasn't shown in former smokers. Now, obviously, this is probably not a nicotine effect. It's more likely to be a smoking effect. But those kind of studies can control for some things like earlier educational achievement um, and um, baseline cognitive functioning. So although I haven't seen any evidence in, in adolescence, it could be that continuing to smoke over a longer period of time affects cognitive decline later in life, although acute effects of nicotine may actually have a boosting effect as well. So, but again, very difficult to disentangle the effects of nicotine versus smoking. Uh, Bengt Wiedberg, a snus innovator and advocate for EU for snus. I have a question to you in the middle. You mentioned uh, snus can cause, um, what do you call it, sudden infant death uh, syndrome and we have 10 million inhabitants in Sweden and we have about 30, less than 30 cases of sudden infant death uh, syndrome each year. We also have the highest rate of population using snus in the world and when it comes to SIDS we are number 275 of 290 inches in the world would you like to comment on that? Um, it, it, it's a great question. I, I actually did not mention sudden cardiac, uh, sudden infant death, but it's a great, great question because that is thought to be increased by um, in utero nicotine exposure. Uh, what we know about snus users, at least what I've read in Sweden, is that there is clear increased risk of low birth weight, of um, Prematurity, of uh, preeclampsia, which is high, high blood pressure before pregnancy, and also stillbirth. So those there seem to be in, um, increases with risk ratios of from 30 percent to 50 percent, depending on which effect. But the lack of uh, of an increase in sudden infant death is really interesting because that that would argue that in utero uh, 
nicotine exposure is not causing sudden infant death. So I'm, that, that's a good, great, I was not aware of that, so thank you for letting me know. If I may comment on this, uh, there's been, uh, there are pot potential confounders. As we know, smoking and possibly snooze use as well, although I'm not so sure about snooze use, there's a very strong social, socioeconomic gradient. And within our populations, people who smoke are less educated, have more difficult lives, more stressful lives, and so on. Uh, so some of this may then also influence other health uh, outcomes. But we have a randomized controlled trial which avoids all these confounders. Uh, there was a big trial of nicotine patches in pregnancy compared to placebo patches in the UK. And rather remarkably, there was no adverse effects on, on anything, basically. And the children were then followed up post-delivery, and they had actually better outcomes in uh, the uh, nicotine patch condition than in placebo patch condition, which could be because, uh, and, and nicotine patch, by the way, didn't have any effect on quit rates. But it may have a, an effect on reducing smoking rate, which would then explain this better outcomes, but the results certainly do not suggest that there are adverse effects of nicotine take in humans. Now it's only one study and you know, there may be some, but I would put quite an emphasis on this because this is randomized as opposed to uh, you know, allowing these confounders. My, my only response, if it's a study that I think there was actually a reduction of expired carbon monoxide suggesting that they, people getting nicotine patches were smoking less. So it's really difficult to sort that out if they're smoking less because that's a huge benefit. Hello, my name is Alexandre. I'm a blogger from Brazil. And one of the most common questions I get from smokers who want to try to use vaping is how much nicotine they need to use in their aliquids compar in comparison to the cigarettes they consume. As far as I know, there is no official indication as like, if I smoke a pack of cigarettes or in what, on a particular brand, uh, how much nicotine should I use on my aliquids? In the end of the day, the guy who's going to tell me that is the guy selling the product to me. So I would like to know if, uh, what can I say to my readers about that topic? Thank you. I'll start with this one. Um, to be honest, I don't think there should be any definite guidelines on this because as I've shown in my work and as Neil has um, quite clearly stated, people very quickly learn to self-titrate. They may need to have some vague guidelines initially, but will soon work it out for themselves. I mean, if you take too much, you get a headache, you feel a bit sick and you stop. If you don't take it much, enough you find yourself vaping a lot so perhaps you need to go up a little bit so i think the advice to be to vapors should be well maybe start higher because if you're getting a better nicotine delivery to match your pre-smoking levels you're more likely to be satisfied to reduce cravings it can help you quit but if you feel aversive responses just try and reduce and then go lower so that that would be my personal advice the evidence shows that vapors soon learn to self titrate as has been commonly shown in tobacco smoking and i think it's very difficult to say this much or this much e-cigarette is equivalent to this many cigarettes because people just use it differently depending on the power depending on the device um, so you you can't make those kind of comparisons I certainly agree with Lynn, uh, and I think there are two other considerations. One, for me, I've, I've spent a lot of time studying the toxicology of these cigarettes as well. The advantage of a high nicotine product, assuming a person will titrate to whatever nicotine they need, is that they take in much less aerosol, and especially if you use a product that uh, does not generate high, high temperatures, then the potential, the risk of breakdown products from heat and the amount of aerosol you're exposed to is much less. So in, from a risk point of view, I think high nicotine is actually better. Now, from an acceptance point of view, that might not be because some vapors like to have lots of aerosol. So it's like a balance between what the vapor wants and what is minimizing the health, health risks. 
Thank you. We've had time for two more questions. So we'll take one down the front and then the lady there. Thank you. All right. Yeah. A quick question for uh, Dr. Benowitz over here on the right. Um, for filming for our movie, You Don't Know Nick Team, we've been talking to a lot of medical providers, and one of the things I've noticed is a big concern with this vasoconstriction, um, and that's been mentioned a couple of different times. One of the things that I, nobody's really been able to answer for me is how long does that last? Is that a, a pretty quick effect as far as vasoconstriction, or is it a long-term effect with that? Uh, it lasts as long as you have significant nicotine levels. Like one study we did years ago, we tracked the time course of the reduction of skin temperature versus nicotine levels in the blood. And when nicotine levels went up, skin temperature went down. And when nicotine levels went down, skin temperature went up. Um, so if you're using a product throughout the day, there's probably some effect throughout the day. Well, my name is Eliana. I'm from New Zealand. I'm a pharmacist and also an organic chemist. And, and something that I found interesting um, on my journey as a pharmacist when I work in a community pharmacist in New Zealand is that um, as pharmacists, we, we have this problem with adherence when we are trying to handle or help uh, elderly when they are suffering from Alzheimer's because the Alzheimer's by itself causes a little bit of troubles with adherence. Um, there is a lot of treatments that have been approved in New Zealand for the use of Alzheimer, even though the evidence is very poor. And uh, one of the examples that I just want to point out as a as acetylcholinesterase inhibitor is donezepil. That it's a medication that causes the same effect in the brain chemistry that nicotine does. And I always found this problem in the most of the patients that we were treating were not having any improvement. But many of them were feeling that smoking was, was more effective for handling their symptoms. And many of them were even recommending other elderly to, to, to go into the journey of smoking because somehow that was helping them into managing their Alzheimer's. Or at least this is what many nurses found out that was somehow helping. What is your point of view on these sort of uh, difficulties that we find on how nicotine has been somehow um, stigmatized but we are given space to new, new molecules just because they come from big pharma. Sorry, I, I didn't quite, quite catch the question there. Okay, so I just in short is why, why we are making nicotine such a demon when we've seen that there is such a big, uh, or at least there is more evidence that's been effective than other medications that are being introduced in the market that don't have much much of, of effect on elderly, especially on Alzheimer. So, so if I understand your question, the question is why are we not um, suggesting or um, certainly condoning the use of nicotine in patients with Alzheimer's disease who say that helps them that's the question. Oh, okay. yeah. uh, well, I'll give my comment first, yeah. and, and then you can give yours. Um, I have no problem with nicotine in, in Alzheimer's. There, are, there have been some clinical trials with mixed results. Uh, I think that's worthwhile. But I would say cigarette smoking is not good for Alzheimer's. Cigarette smoking is bad, and cigarette smoking increases the risk of Alzheimer's despite potentially beneficial effects of nicotine because of the other things in cigarette smoke. But if someone is functions better with nicotine with Alzheimer's, I have no problem. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry, I thought your question was about adherence. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> hear the Alzheimer's part. As Neil said, yes, yeah, smoking has been associated with increased risk of certain dementias and Alzheimer's later in life. Um, not certainly, yeah, yeah. Um, but nicotine, absolutely, um, yeah, if, um, elderly patients are saying that helps with their symptoms and they can take nicotine in a form other than smoking, then I don't have a problem with that either. No, I, ha I have a question. Uh, sorry to you know, use, uh, abuse my position here. Uh, regarding this nicotine effects on other enforcers, oh, yeah. I think it's a very interesting issue that uh, people on nicotine may appreciate the pleasures in life more than if they don't have nicotine. But I'm puzzled by one aspect of it. So in the apple picker, or in logically you expect you have nicotine in you, and now what you're gonna do will be more enjoyable than without it, like this uh, 
cocaine issue and, and mm. bubble pickers. But in real life, smokers take nicotine after their enjoyment. So typically Sometimes. they smoke after having sex or after having a good meal. That's when they want to have a cigarette. How does it square with this? Yeah, yeah, with sex and after eating, uh, there's probably physiological reasons for that, I think, to aid digestion and so on. Um, but with other things like having a, having a drink, um, taking other drugs, socializing, and so on. Um, I mean, we've also done some studies of smoking um, whilst watching film clips as well. And people report finding film clips more enjoyable when, when, they've, smoked, when they've smoked compared to when they haven't. Um, the question about, yeah, after the event, I think maybe more, uh, uh, probably there's different explanations there. Do you have any plausible I don't know exactly, but <laughs> but there are other examples of co-use which are interesting. So, for example, marijuana um, and tobacco is are mixed, and people who use the mixture say that it's much more pleasurable than using them separately. So, and and it makes sense that nicotine could augment the effects of THC. So I think there are some examples where it's used together because people like it better together. The expression I have is that the joint, keeps, uh, the, the joint keeps going out if there's no tobacco in the, the chip. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to finish here. I know we could keep discussing for hours, and I know there's many more questions. I know our speakers will be happy to talk to you all in the break. I don't want to deny our panel their caffeine hit or, of course, you. So please join me in thanking very much our panel speakers this morning. <laughs>